Thank you. All right. Um, can we also get a round of applause for Toby's tunes? I am so into <laughs> Like the Tasia song, I'm gonna have that stuck in my head all night. Um, all right, so I'm Sophie. Thanks again for having me smashing. It is so great to be here. Love the smashing crew. Uh, so as Vitaly mentioned, I currently lead up content design at The New Yorker. I also manage a team of content designers across all of Condé Nast. So that's Vogue, GQ, or Allure, Vanity Fair, Wired, and so on and so forth. Um, I was actually the first content designer across all of Condé Nast and my last company, Envision, which I think means that companies are increasingly investing in this discipline. Could also mean I'm just a glutton for punishment, hard to say. Um, before that, I was at Lyft wearing a bunch of different hats, and a couple of decades before that, I wasn't doing a whole lot of work, but I was mostly cheering on the San Francisco Giants at baseball games. So enough about me. Today's session, we are going to talk about all things content design, what it is, why it's important. We will talk about how to integrate content design into your product design practice every single step of the way, and we'll leave with some nice, tangible best practices and takeaways that you can start embedding into your day-to-day -day work, maybe even day-to-day -day life. Lots to cover, so let's get started. First up, what are we talking about? What the heck is content design? Uh, you might hear me refer to it in a couple of different ways, where you might know it as UX writing. Um, there is this shift within the industry from calling it UX writing to content design, including at Condé Nast. We just updated the name of our discipline about a week ago. And I think this is a good shift because it really centers the practice in design and kind of moves us away from this misconception that content design or UX writing is just about filling text boxes with words. There's a whole lot more to it than that, which I would be happy to talk about at any break for hours on end. I apologize in advance for that. But the definition that I like to use for content, des content design is that it's the practice of designing useful content that guides users through digital experiences. A lot to unpack there, so let's break it down a little bit. First off, content design is a practice. It's about a lot more than just writing, as I mentioned. It spans nearly every department, from support to marketing to legal, and every step of the product creation practice. So it's really the only type of writing that takes place before the product or feature is complete pre-launch, which really differentiates it from something like marketing copywriting or technical writing. More on that in a minute. Content design is also focused on useful language. So it's not selling, it's not splashiness. It only comes into play when a visual cue, like movement or color, is unable to communicate the concept at hand. And finally, content design guides users through digital experiences. So it really puts users first, and it's action-oriented. You're helping the user complete the task at hand with minimal friction. So in other words, content design Design is basically a design discipline that helps the product and its user communicate with one another. Or in other, other words, product design is a form of content design. Content design is more of a written lens than a visual one. So as I mentioned just a minute ago, we talked about technical writing, copywriting. What is the difference between all of these different word things? So let's drill into that a bit more as well. Content design sits on a product design team. We largely work in Figma or your design tool, uh, and we focus on designing the content that you're interacting with. This is different than something like a technical writer, which normally sits on an engineering team. They're working with documentation. They're writing about features or products that already exist to explain them to the user. And finally, marketing copywriters sit normally on the marketing team. They're focused on announcing or driving adoption for a new feature. So there's this line basically between content design, technical writing, and copywriting, where content design takes place pre-launch, technical and copywriting are normally post-launch. Um, so that's content design in general. Now, when it comes to good content design, I normally refer to something like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, or if you're still thinking about lunch, a food pyramid, where you have to accomplish each level in order to move up. So above all, or 
below all, I guess. Uh, UX copy isn't UX copy if it's not useful. You should be able to justify every single character on the screen, which is especially important when you're working with something as small as a phone or a watch interface. Next, that language must be clear. So if you haven't achieved clarity, normally by being the one who asks a ton of questions of your PM or the other folks on your team, you're basically getting into the weeds so that your users don't have to. And if you haven't achieved that clarity, none of the next three steps matter. Once your message is clear, you want to be as consistent as possible. So this is where you can kind of forget everything that you learned in writing class, because repetition is good when it comes to UX copy. You want to use the same exact words throughout your entire flow, because when it comes to product design, different words mean different actions. So that repetition really helps your users. Uh, oops, next up. Um, we have concision. So of course, small screens, you're wanting to use the fewest number of words possible, but you never sacrifice clarity for the sake of concision. If you've chopped a couple of words off of that phrase, but your user has no idea where it's going to take them, then you haven't really moved yourself up the pyramid at all. And finally, at the very top, we have those branded moments. So these are these really memorable interactions that people often associate with programs like Slack, where there's a lot of personality. There are emoji, there are exclamation points. Uh, but if you haven't achieved clarity, if your user doesn't know what they're getting out of this interaction, they aren't going to appreciate a pun in the first place. So that's good content design, or at least part of it. Now let's take a look at some examples. So I mentioned that I had previously worked at Lyft, which is a ride-sharing platform similar to Uber in the US. Uh, and I like to use this example because both Lyft and Uber are asking for the exact same thing at this point. Where are you going? What is your destination? They're asking for the same amount of information, but they approach their content design in very different ways. So in the Uber example on the left, they're very sleek, very direct, much like Uber's branding, where to? It's very simple and very short. And this might be because Uber is global. They're translating this language into a lot of different other languages. So having ample space allows for lengthier languages maybe like German, uh, without breaking this interface. On the right, Lyft takes a completely different approach. They personalize, they use the passenger's name, they have this little quip, and they're able to spell out where are you going. They don't translate into other languages, they're only based in North America, hence the longer language here. Uh, and as you look at these screens, you see that there is quite a lot of UX copy within them, even though it feels pretty natural, pretty organic. So your content designers are making decisions like, are we able to fit the majority of addresses onto two lines, given that there are multiple options that could be dynamically pulled in here? Do we need to shorten the word minute? And if we do, do we add the extra noise of a period at the end? All of these are micro decisions that ultimately impact the usability of the screen. The more you learn about UX copy and content design, the more you learn that it is everywhere. There are hundreds of decisions that have gone into probably every single screen that you interact with every single day. And that without UX copy and content design, our products are not only useless, but nearly unrecognizable. They also risk being just as unusable with UX copy too, when they lack the traits in that pyramid of best practices, when they're plagued with jargon or unclear CTAs, does cancel, cancel the action or close the modal, or this trend of really terrible dark patterns where the secondary option is shaming the user, no, I don't eat healthy food. So this all, ladders up to the fact that, yes, of course, usability is essential when it comes to product design and content design within it. But the power of great content design is that it goes beyond just usability. So there's this great new book called Because Internet by Gretchen McCulloch, and it talks about the fact that the internet has changed written language faster than ever before. Content design is built for this new medium, where a simple sentence can look like a paragraph on mobile, and long form writing just doesn't do. It accounts for the fact that every single character on the screen needs to be worth the valuable real estate that it takes up, and it reaches beyond literacy, which is just our ability to communicate through written word, and infuses every word with strategy in order to drive action. 
So this in turn creates better products that proactively reduce friction and answer to user needs, which then leads to better user experiences, which in turn creates more loyal users and fewer support tickets and stronger brands, because when your users know your voice, you develop a relationship. It builds trust and credibility. So there's a massive opportunity here. And so now we're going to talk about how you can actually put this into practice by talking about the ideal product design process. So I do think it's important to note that we are not diving directly into the actual writing of words quite yet. And I think this uh, reinforces the fact that content design is much more than just filling text boxes. There is a wealth of context that takes place before you get to that point. So we'll take a look at a classic example from Stanford's design school, where the design team would normally move from research to lo-fi sketches, prototyping, maybe some testing. And most teams start somewhere like this, where words are largely an afterthought. You've gone through the majority of the design process, you get to testing, and then you run into some users that are saying, I don't understand exactly what I'm supposed to be doing here or what this feature is or why it's called this. You're leaving a lot of opportunity on the table. So once you start implementing content design as a practice, you start looking something like this, where language is implemented early and often and is really woven through every stage of the design process. Because a line of copy is rarely ever just a line of copy. There is quite a lot of understanding that you gain by thinking about the words that you're going to use as you research, wireframe, test, and so on and so forth. So you can craft a word bank as you research. You can sketch with words instead of using lorem ipsum. We'll talk about all of these things over the course of this session. So this all sounds great, but the bigger question is, how do you actually put this into practice? What methods can you use to build words into each step along the way? So we're going to give this a shot with an imaginary company that I kind of wish exists. So for the sake of today's talk, we're going to say we're working on a Zoom plugin that alerts you when you are wearing the same shirt that you were yesterday. I sorely need this. So we're going to talk through how you would think about copy at every single stage of that design process. So here's our problem statement. How might we alert users that they're wearing that shirt again before joining a Zoom call. And this is also kind of like a job to be done if you're familiar with that sort of framework. If I, as the user, am wearing the same shirt again, I would like to hire you to notify me, essentially. So we have the ask. Let's kick off our process. So we're starting with this empathize stage. And your different teams might call this something different, you know, understand, something like that. But basically, you are hoping to understand the problem at hand and the need that your users have, of course. So you're doing a lot of research already. You're trying to understand where your users are coming from, where they want to go next, how could they could possibly get there. You'll also want to research the words themselves. So, uh, so how do your users refer to this product? Do they use the word shirt or tea? If they don't want to act on the alert now, would they snooze it or ask it to remind them later? And so on and so forth. And if you aren't able to do user research, then looking at support tickets is also a great way to get a lot of information about the actual language that your users are using. Um, you can also look at what your competitors are saying. Are there industry standard terms that you should be implementing as well? Or is it worth going against the grain and uh, implementing that additional level of understanding that's necessary? And also, what words do you already use across your product? You'll most likely want to use the same words here as well. So next, you'll want to, of course, define the flow as you're moving into the next stage of the process. So this is when you're doing things like journey mapping, identifying mental models, um, and understanding how a user would expect this conversation to go. So this is why it can be really helpful to literally write out a draft of the conversation that would take place from the user's point of view to the product's point of view. And this is a method that Sarah Culver uh, implemented at Slack um, before she moved over to Figma a couple of years ago. So this next slide is hers. Uh, this was for a feature that would allow you to archive multiple channels at once. So we see that the user wants to move ahead with this app. 
act, and then later realizes that they're also going to need the functionality that would allow them to uh, deselect or exclude certain channels from that bulk approach. So this is a very lo-fi, very approachable way to define not only what a user needs, but also how you can start to breadcrumb or spread that information throughout the experience. Um, to start to identify what could be communicated through visual design as opposed to copy, because that's always a faster way to communicate. And it helps you identify the proper tone, because you're figuring out what that relationship looks like between the user and the interface. So if we're giving this a shot with our Zoom plugin, we can start to take a look at what this conversation looks like. So what questions or concerns would the user have in this situation. So we might end up with something like this. Like, hey, bud, I think you wore the same striped shirt yesterday. Do you have time to change right now, or do you want me to remind you later? So this introduces a new need. That user might be about to sign on to stand up that day, and they don't have the time to go run and change at that moment. So as you're writing out that conversation, you're implementing what words or phrases you identified during the research phase, well, you weave them in here, and then now you can understand what that conversation looks like on both sides. So this gives us a ton of content to work with as we move into wireframing. So I don't think lorem ipsum is quite as common now as it was a few years ago, but it has to be said that lorem ipsum is most susceptible to being introduced at this stage of the process. And there really is never any place where you should be using placeholder copy. Instead, this is exactly where you should be wireframing with what I like to call lo-fi copy, or do some sketching with words, where you're mocking up the most important text, things like verbs, CTAs, headlines, so you can identify which pieces of information go where. So it really does make a difference when the words and the visual design are experienced in tandem, because you'll uncover problems earlier on, and you're able to move a lot faster later. So this is something that Biz Sanford talked about a lot during her time at Shopify. And I love this example of hers because it points out what good lo-fi copy looks like. It's not just labeling that you will later fill in benefits one, two, and three. It's actually filling in what those benefits are, because then you can determine whether there actually are three or four benefits that you need to include here, or whether you actually need much more space to spell out your pricing model. So you can see the difference between these two. The second version is already longer, has identified that there are actually four benefits instead of three, and that we're going to need to fit in quite a lot of complicated numerical information in that pricing system. So identifying a lot of these needs much earlier on. So if we give this a go, we can pull from the language across our research. We can use the information covered in the conversation that we sketched out. We realize that we're going to need that snooze option. And we can pull out some of those key words to make sure that we have enough room to represent them, or that we're not designing for language that doesn't actually need to be there. So you might start drafting different approaches to what this copy could look like. Maybe we try one that has a headline, another that doesn't but specifies a specific amount of minutes. And then this version on the right really puts a lot of focus on the close option, but also introduces this new option where we have a drop down for snooze that allows for some more personalization. And this gives you an opportunity to have this conversation with your team and sort out what exactly the scope looks like for a feature like this. If the research and the first discovery sessions are showing that your users really need this level of personalization, now you can talk about these sorts of decisions as opposed to cramming them in at the very end of the design process. So maybe you're working in tandem with your PM, with the rest of your team, and you determine that this last option is the direction that you'd like to go into, where you have a bit more functionality around snooze, and you're really focusing in on that close button, because the ideal golden path here is that your user sees this alert, closes it, can either go swap out a shirt or move on with their day. All right, so we've made it to prototyping, which is where you take your lo-fi copy and move it into hi-fi. So those headlines, those verbs, those CTAs are able to be polished. And in order to do that, you need to know what makes for good UX writing. So we're actually going to take a little detour here and talk about those best practices for the language itself. So I'd like to point out here that we are now on slide 45, and we're just now talking about the actual 
words part of content design. So all of those processes got us to this point. Now we can start to fill in those text boxes with the final language that has been built with all of that context below the surface. So a few different best practices that I like to call in out here. The first step I think is most relevant to this group, which is translating jargon. This is what I like to call the curse of knowledge. So this basically means that we all have such a detailed understanding of the feature, the error that's occurring, the product at hand, that we're using language that only power users or worse, we can understand. So it's important to keep, their mind, keep in mind that even if your users are particularly advanced, if your business is thriving, you will always have new users. That's the ideal state. So using language that anyone could understand, including those new users, will be uh, a very beneficial approach for you here. So avoiding jargon is one of the main reasons why content designers often ask so many questions. We are getting into the weeds so that our users don't have to. And simplified language doesn't mean that you're dumbing it down. In reality, it's one of the hardest parts about the job because you're improving the accessibility and approachability of that flow. Speaking of error messages, this is the copy that I think we all know is forgotten most often. We either can't anticipate those error messages, they come up a little bit late in the game, but they are really tricky because your user is already in an elevated mental state. They're probably already frustrated with you. So there are ways to write for error messages that can help deflate the scenario. So we're trying not to use emotional language. Try to avoid uh, basically assigning blames, blame using phrases like, you messed up, you entered the wrong uh, password. So instead, you'll want to specify exactly what went wrong. Whoop. I think I'm seeing some error messages myself over here. Um, specify what went wrong, try to be as specific as possible, and then say exactly what they can do to fix it if possible. Even better, provide a link directly to that fix with very clear anchor text that explains exactly where that link is going to take them. This improves the accessibility of the screen, of course, so folks who are maybe using screen readers understand exactly where they're going. Once you've gotten the words right, you'll want to take a look at your sentence structure. Uh, and I should also say that a lot of this guidance is pretty English language specific, um, but the concept of people skimming uh, and maybe not reading the entire sentence I think is unfortunately pretty universal. By front-loading the most important language and keeping it actionable, then we know that even the folks who miss the later ends of the sentence or don't read the entire paragraph will still understand the takeaway. They understand the most important bit. So this way, uh, you're using active language instead of passive language. Your address will need to be added, doesn't exactly specify who's adding it, when or why. Instead, in this second example, even if that, that user only reads add your email address, they understand what they need to do here. Now we're getting into the really fun part of this talk, which is punctuation. It's my personal favorite part. I'm very good at parties, obviously. Um, outside of things like periods, commas, other standard uh, pieces of punctuation, I'd avoid getting too crazy with things like ampersands, exclamation points, semicolons, for a number of different reasons. Ampersands tend to bring the most amount of attention to the least important word in the sentence, which is and. And uh, exclamation points tend to be tough unless you really have a truly incredible exclamation to make. Um, otherwise, it can sometimes come across as though you're kind of laughing at your own joke. So we want to reserve exclamation points for those moments that really, truly matter. With other punctuation, really the most important thing is that you are 100% certain that you're using it correctly. There is nothing more distracting than a rogue semicolon that one of your users identifies as being used incorrectly. Same goes for em dashes. It's really helpful to use the proper character for an em dash as opposed to something like two hyphens. I see like three smiles in the audience. I'm like, these are my people. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, and capitalization is, I promise, one of the last very nitpicky parts of this presentation. Um, I get this question a lot. Should we use sentence case or title case when it comes to English language flows? And the answer is that these are the two main styles. Maybe now that Dina's here, there might be a, a Dina style as well with the lowercase d's. Um, but 
People have a lot of feelings about them. The thing is, there really is no right answer. There are pros and cons for each method. So for a sentence case, it's better for long phrases because your user's eye isn't having to leap up and down quite as frequently. That said, it's a little bit more approachable. It feels a little bit less serious, which is why so many tech companies use this approach. Title case carries a bit more gravitas. You're capitalizing quite a few more words within that phrase, which is why it's recommended for shorter phrases. You're leaping up and down a bit more. Um, title case stands out in context. It's great for things like proper nouns and phrases, of course. Uh, sentence case, of course, is easy to implement because the only rule that you're, recommend that you're remembering is to capitalize the first word. So the most important thing to me, at least, is that you make a decision and you're consistent. The uh, kind of flip side of this is that avoiding arbitrary capitalization is another way to keep things nice and simple and functioning, hopefully, uh, because those randomly capitalized words, again, are very distracting. So it can be really hard to resist the urge to turn that new feature that you're working on into a proper noun by capitalizing its name, especially if you've been working on it for months and months and months. But when it comes to things like common features, photo uploading, file sharing, those are standard features that probably don't deserve a name of their own. The good news is that there are quite a few examples of this being done well. The one that I often point to is trusted contacts in this Help Center page. So you really only see the phrase in the Help Center, but it is a consistent term that the team has aligned on, though capitalization would be distracting in this case because the concept of a trusted or emergency contact is really nothing new, so it doesn't deserve its own identity. Something like Dropbox Paper, on the other hand, is a fancy proprietary proper noun. It's branded and everything. It's Dropbox's own word processor, and they've put quite a lot of effort into giving it its own identity. And while capitalization helps the name stand out in context, the product itself is different from its competitors. So. That's my capitalization rant. Thank you for sticking with me. Um, the very last best practice that I'll leave you with is repetition. So we've mentioned at the start that repetition is good when it comes to UX copy because different words indicate to the user that that action, that button, that word has a different meaning and therefore a different end result. So the, the example that comes up most often is sign in and log in. Two different words, similar meanings. Uh, the example on the left uses a mix of two and also log in as both a verb and a noun. This is why I recommend going with sign in if you are designing an English language flow, because it sounds a little bit less like jargon and it doesn't introduce the complexity of whether it should be one word or two. All right, so we've finished our detour uh, of the grammatical road route. Um, now we'll get back to our design process and we have reached the prototyping step where we are applying those takeaways to our lo-fi copy, really polishing it and bringing it up to that high fidelity. So remember, you'll want to prioritize clarity, concise messaging, and consistency. Those branded moments will only work when you've achieved everything else in that pyramid. And by the time you're done with it, every single word in your prototype should be essential and provide value. You'll also want to make sure that your copy is free of jargon, actionable, capitalized intentionally, punctuated simply, and helpful, especially in error states. So now if we take these guidelines, we put them to the test, we can take a look at the hi-fi language that we've landed on. So using this format that we landed on before, where we have a single line of copy, a large closed CTA, and this snooze drop down, we can explore with different iterations of maybe the tone. We can figure out how casual we want to get, since we've identified from that initial conversation that this is a friendlier, friendlier interface, maybe something like that of a friend or a college roommate. And we can sort out what feels right for us. We identified during that early research that the word shirt and tea uh, were common commonly used by our users. Um, and we can take a look at these different options for how we're using punctuation. That would immediately strike out this version on the right, not only because the tone is a little bit unhinged, but also because we have this kind of wonky M dash double hyphen situation in there. 
Uh, middle version, maybe this isn't the right place for an exclamation point. I don't know that this is a particularly exciting moment if this is a, a modal that the user will see quite frequently. So maybe the team lands on this version on the left. It's nice and straightforward. It's clear. It has a bit of a casual tone with the CTA being got it, but isn't something that they'll get frustrated seeing every single day if they are uh, a frequent, uh, frequent shirt rewearer. Um, so we move forward with this version. Uh, this also leaves some leeway in case we'd like to iterate on different versions of this copy, maybe to switch it up. Um, but that could be in V2 of this notification. So now in the final step that we'll go over today, we're going to put this copy to the test. And this is a question that I get very frequently, is how the heck do you test copy? And their answer is there are a handful of ways, but it really kind of depends on the copy at hand. For today's session, we will focus in on what I like to call a highlighter test, where you basically have your tester highlight any words that are and aren't working for them. So helpful words are highlighted in green, confusing words are in yellow, and useless words are in red. So of course, you'll want to keep the words in green. Words in yellow should probably be altered a bit so that they become more helpful than confusing. And those useless words in red should probably be removed altogether because they don't deserve that valuable real estate that they're taking up. So if we were to go through this exercise with the copy that we've landed on at this point, you might have a user point out that we're using two different points of view. We have you in the headline and me in that uh, snooze bar. So we might recommend that we alter remind me in to snooze, which is a win-win. It removes that, con that confusion, and it's also a little bit shorter, so you get a little bit of concision thrown in as well. So at this point, we should be feeling pretty confident in our copy. It's been researched. It's gone through a few rounds of drafting and uh, iterating, and it's been tested at this point, and we've made it all the way through the design process that we identified from the very start, from our initial research phases, through lo-fi and hi-fi work. And of course, there are plenty more steps beyond this. QA, when you make sure that no details were dropped along the way, uh, documenting their, your choices so that your marketing and support teams can use your terminology correctly, carry that through to their announcements, um, analyzing the metrics post-launch, of course, and iterating from there. But the journey never really ends, does it? Um, but this should get us off to a good start. So I'll just have to save the rest for the next Smashing Conference. Thank you. Wonderful, Dolly. Thank you so thank much, you. Sophie. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So would you like to join me for yeah, your conversation? Yeah, This is where the chocolate is. Yes, this is where we have some chocolates left. Yeah. All right, well, we have so many questions that came in. All right. So I don't even know where to start. My people. One of the, yeah? Oh, I was just saying my, my people. Like. Oh, yes, yes. So I think that it's, um, uh, there are many, many, many of them, but I think that I'm going to start with one that I think is going to, um, that many are going to have, many people are going to have. Okay. Do you have any tips on how to approach legal and or compliance requirements where long copy, formal copy, and legalese are usually needed? Yes. Sad, very sad face emoji. Yes. I also have a very sad face in real life when it comes to legal copy. Um, the best advice that I have is to focus on creating a relationship with your legal advisor. That's the thing that has helped me the most. Of course, a lot of the time you're going to end up with you know, two paragraphs of fine print at the end of your order form because that's what's required. Uh, but by developing a relationship with the lawyer themselves, whether it's a consultant or an advisor, helps kind of bring both of you to the mm -hmm. middle so that at least you're understanding their framework or their reasoning for requiring so much text. So then you can at least propose changes and try and meet closer to the middle as opposed to being sent a paragraph of requirements and just having to kind of blindly insert that. Right. It's, it's the best advice I have. That makes sense. It's that tough. Makes sense. Mm, another question that came up quite a bit is, what workflow would you recommend for multilingual platforms if you don't want everyone to just be translations or a main language where each language is supposed to be as important as the other? What would be the workflow for writing copy there? Mm -hmm. um, I think there are a few different aspects to it. So one is the tooling that you use. There are some really exciting new uh, features, workflows that are coming out um, in different uh, copy tools. So one is literally called copy. Um, and they have different settings that you can use to 
basically save different versions of the language. Um, the other thing that I think helps is, again, instead of kind of sending off a spreadsheet to be translated and getting that back, um, adding in as much context as you can around the strings that are being translated so that your team who's doing the translating, whether it's third party or offsite, is not just one-to-one -one black and white translating words. They can make decisions that are more educated based off of the intent of the copy, which tends to make it sound a, a bit more kind of human. Yeah. All right. Uh, another one. This is it's kind of interesting because um, all the questions, you know, because you have been speaking at a couple of Smashing conferences now in the US and so on. I feel like I have the same questions appearing really? over and over. Yeah. Yeah. I was so. I was interested to see how this would go outside of the US, especially because yes. so much of the guidance is English specific. Yeah. So. But for example, one thing that comes up all the time, of course, is how do you balance being too witty, smart, and being clear? Mm. I thought you were going to end that at how do you balance oh, being okay. too witty just for me, no. myself. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think it's, it's that, sorry, works that was too. a That's really a bad fair question. Yeah, no. I'll take it. Um, no, I, I think it's a really fair question. Um, it's something that we ran into at Lyft quite a lot because we would err, we would sometimes push too far into just weird. We would try to be quirky and fun and playful, and it, it just towed the line a lot. Um, one question that I always ask is, how frequently is the user going to see this modal? So if it's a, you know a sign-in screen that new users are going to see all the time, then that's probably not the place for a really kind of big expression of the brand or that kind of quirkiness. If it's maybe a screen that's relatively painless. Mm. Uh, you know, they haven't just encountered a major error. They're probably not frustrated, and they won't see it quite often. That's when maybe you can sprinkle a little bit of fun in. Um, one opportunity that we had to add a little bit of personality into something recently was the New Yorker iOS app. Um, as the splash screen is loading, it's just a couple of seconds, but we have this status update that cycles through. Uh, and we decided to add in phrases like not only loading, but also captioning cartoons, mm -hmm. doodling, adjusting monocle that was related to the brand, but it wasn't something that would interfere with the user's ability to complete the task at hand. Yeah, I think you probably don't want to make a joke if some, somebody is losing the data. Mm. That's probably not going to come across well. I, I, can, I can see that. Yeah. Uh, some technical questions as well. For example, where do you research that your user, for example, use the word T? Do you have tips where to get this information from and how? Yeah. Um, so in terms of researching the language that users are using, um, my favorite go-to is support tickets, because you are getting completely unfiltered users, for better or worse. Um, and then you can really see, especially the nouns that they use to describe your product. Uh, another example is um, I often partner up with, we're very lucky to have a researcher on our team. Uh, but we don't ask pointed copy questions, because we don't want to lead the user. We don't want them to start to self-edit. So we'll just ask questions like, um, what do you expect to appear on the next screen? What do you expect to happen when you tap this button? And then you can start to listen to the phrases that they use themselves so that we can inject that into the flow. All right, OK. Um, wow, this is interesting. I'm really looking forward to your answer now. Uh -oh. So who wins in the war between UX copy and SEO copy? Ooh. New, uh, news uh, example, example, newspaper example, local news. UX copy versus city name news SEO copy. Mm -hmm. This is a safe space. I think it's a very <laughs> safe space. I don't know, is anybody who is uh, the person who asked that question? Yeah. I have a feeling that they might be leaning on the SEO side, I think, or not. Yeah. I mean, I think it depends on the screen that you're looking at. So in some situations, of course, that is an SEO play. I think ultimately the ask is, what is the like OKR or ultimate goal that that screen is climbing up to? Um, if you are looking to basically top of the funnel, catch as many new users as possible, then that's probably an SEO play. Play. Right. But once you're working on building that relationship, habit building, moving them further down the funnel, if it's you know, a subscription product like I'm working on, then it's probably a UX play because you're focused on a good user experience as opposed to just grabbing clicks. I shouldn't exactly. say just, but right. grabbing so clicks. If you have an account and you're logging in, this is uh, anyway not like Google facing or public facing URL anyway. Exactly. And I think it. I don't think that one excludes the other, maybe, necessarily. So right. you can actually maybe play with that. Ideally, it's a partnership. Yeah. yeah. One very serious question, actually. Oh, wow. Uh, has content design kind of taken over information architectures, taxonomy, navigation, mm -hmm. and other facets? 
this process used to be in part the domain of information architect? Mm -hmm. And if so, what's the boundary between today's product designers and content designers? I love this question. This is whoever asked this, please come find me. Oh, of course, I shouldn't be surprised. Um, so uh, I actually just had a series of conversations with our information architecture team. So we do have a content design team and an information architecture team. Um, and basically, where we drew the line is that content design is much more user-facing and consumer-facing. There is, of course, that middle ground where we meet. There's that handshake where we trade off. Um, but at least at a, a content or a media company, a lot of information architecture, as that team their responsibility is largely on the back end. So tagging, how we make sure that what we design that's user facing maps to how we're actually pulling that information on the back end. But that middle ground is murky and it's tough because we have to have that trade off between the two. Um, I think this also points to the fact that content design is never done in a silo. Almost all of our work is being that common thread through almost every single team at the company. So we're working not only on the product design team with product, you know, with data, with our developers, uh, but we're also kind of that baton pass or that smooth handoff with information architecture, with the marketing team, with support, with legal. Um, oftentimes, we are also a team of maybe one who is working across all of the products as well, and so we have an opportunity to make sure that they're all speaking to one another, and the user's experience does seem like one cohesive, solidified voice. Right. Maybe the last one, and then we can probably have more questions in, yeah. uh, in the Q&A later. Uh, would you say that if you don't have a dedicated UX writer person in, in the house, uh, should it be the role of designers to take over the copy, or should it be the role of, I don't know, SEO, marketing? Uh, how, or how, like, should it be federated? Should it be centralized? What yeah. do you think would work best? Yeah. Um, I'm glad that you asked this, because I'm guessing this is the situation of almost everyone, if now, not anybody. Everyone is anybody in this, in this situation? A few people. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, you. That's yeah, right. this is very common, yeah. <laughs> yes. And I mean, normally the work falls to the designer who writes well, um, and that's. <laughs> <laughs> that's you. Right? Okay. Yeah, that's, yes. that's usually what happens. Um, I think the most valuable thing to do is, and I think this is what we talked about at San Francisco as well, is refuse to put lorem ipsum or placeholder copy into your designs. I think that's a great first step because it forces everyone to start thinking about the language. I think that's a, a pretty easy kind of black and white rule that is often more painful than people realize it will be. Um, and that, yes, you may be the one kicking that rule off, but it forces your PMs, you know, your other designers, et cetera, to start thinking about language. And that might help get the ball rolling to encourage uh, a more specialized hire like a content designer. Um, but I think in terms of answering your question, it really kind of depends on the team or the company. A lot of the time, the work falls to the designer, or maybe you have a PM who's really mm -hmm. engaged and interested in writing. Um, sometimes you bring in marketing copywriters, which tends to be tough because uh, it's it's really a different type of writing. It's you know much more long form, much splashier versus usability. Um, but uh, having those advocates for the craft and having folks who understand how impactful it can be um, can normally help you start building a case for a more specialized hire. Right. Well, excellent insights. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Wonderful, it's wonderful great to be insights. here. As always, yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.